All right, let's open our Bible, please, the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 16. It's good to be back this morning in the house of the Lord. Good to see you here for the Sunday school hour. And I hope you'll pray the Lord to bless and have his way, and God's will will be done. It's an honor to be back here at Whitfield. I do love and appreciate you and your pastor and his family and all of you and the work of God that goes on here. Uh, you know, I know it is so worldly, but thank God for Facebook. We can keep up with each other, what's going on in the work of God. I remember one day, preacher, I was, somebody sent me a text and asked me if I would forward it, and I did. And about that time, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, I give you a text. Why don't you forward it? And so I began that today's text from the sacred text, and I don't do it every day, but I, I use it. Use it means that we can, but I appreciate the keeping up with the church here and what's going on, what the Lord's doing. Beautiful sanctuary you have remodeled and and if you could just remodel your preacher and get him looking new again, <laughs> it'd be great. Amen. Uh, there's a couple of areas I'm not going to name where, but he needs a little fixing on. <laughs> and top and bottom. Amen. From top to bottom. No. <laughs> oh, how did I get off on that? But it's good to be saved. Again, I do want to say I appreciate so much your support. I'll just take a moment and say this. We're broadcasting somewhere in 120 times a day, somewhere in that area. I can't keep up with it, really. And then right now, this storm will have battled a lot of our, our main stations of my own. Are you, I, I thought you were shifting your time for mine, okay? Uh, I thought maybe I wasn't on the microphone. But anyway, I appreciate it. Our radio bill still runs about $5,000, a month, $5,000. You have a part in that. And I tell you, it's a real blessing. I don't have to worry about it. I mean, I'm serious. God has just paid the bills uh, month after month. It takes, uh, you know, something every month, but God does it. And I praise the Lord for it. And you pray for it, that the Word of God will have free course and God will use us to the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, on a personal note, I've had the busiest summer this year. I believe I've had in my entire ministry. I have not had a break since the 4th of July. I don't have one to Christmas. So, And some of the meetings, I'm, some weeks I'm doing two meetings. I'll be in two meetings, Lord willing, next week, Sunday through Wednesday, and Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, two mission, two meetings next week. So... I'm glad to be busy. You pray God would help us and bless us, and thank you again for your prayers, your support, your friendship, and let's just do what we can while we can to the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're here for a Faith Promise Missions Conference, and I, I run into a couple of things this year, preacher, that, you know, I like when the Lord challenged you into a certain area of study, and earlier this year, I, I, I did a study on faith. And I asked the question, what is faith? Well, there's a verse of Scripture that, can I say it, we think answers that. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You know what I said when I read that? What in the world does that mean? <laughs> but faith is possessing in our heart what we cannot hold in our hand. Faith is possessing in our heart what we cannot hold in our hand, what we cannot see with our eyes. Faith is a trusting, obedient response to God. And I want to say this. It's often said, preacher, that this is the most important meeting of the church this year, and I have no disagreement with that, but I want to make it more personal. This is the most important meeting this year in your life. In your life. In your life. You say, Brother Blue, what's so important? It's not just missions, it's obedience. It's obedience. That's what's important. This is the most important meeting in your, in your life as far as reaching lost or concerned. Because through the mission program of this church, there'll be people at the judgment seat of Christ we'll meet for the first time that we've had a part in investing in their lives. So I encourage you to be here every service. Let's pray the Lord to bless and have his way and God's will be done. Have your Bible open. Let's stand together, please. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. If you're able to stand, if you're not able, that's okay. But I want to read this passage of Scripture, have a moment of prayer, and then just dive in. You pray God will help us in the Word of God today. The Bible said in verse number 1, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let everyone you lay by him in store, as God had prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. 
When I come, whomsoever you shall approve of your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Keep your Bible open. Let's bow our heads and hearts for a moment of prayer and then the study of the Word of God or the Sunday school hour. Our precious Heavenly Father, again, the Lord, not the throne of grace and mercy, in Jesus' name, I bow before you to pray. Father, I do want to say thank you for the joy of salvation. Lord, I want to thank you one more time. You let me be born where there were churches, Bibles, preachers, Christians, all of my life, Lord, I've had access to the Word of God, the house of God, people of God, and men of God. Lord, from even before I arrived by birth, while I was in my mother's womb, my heart and life was bathed in prayer. Lord, in worship and in the knowledge of God, thank you for your blessings upon me. Yet, fathers, I count my blessings. Make me aware of the fact that multitudes around the world cannot make the statements I've just made. Many, dear Lord, today have never seen a Bible. They've never heard a preacher. They've never met a Christian. They live in heathen darkness. They'll die there. If we who have the gospel do not reach them with the gospel of the grace of God, please, Lord, emphasize that burden upon our heart during these days. Do what you want to do and what needs to be done in all of our lives. Give us, dear Lord, that spirit of obedience. Give us a readiness to will and do that, dear Lord, you speak to us about. Work in lies. You will be done. We'll praise you for all you do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Do keep your Bible open, please, for this study of the Word of God. Uh, I want to introduce a message this morning, and I'll deal with it in both services, the Lord willing, just on this simple text, what the Bible teaches about giving. Now, I want to make a statement, and please do not take me to be uh, of a wrong attitude when I say this. When it comes to the Word of God, we must put aside how we feel, what we think, what others do, or the way we've always done it. We're not going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and give account for the way others have done it. We're not going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account if we've done it the way we feel like it. But we must come to the Word of God. The Bible said you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Very briefly, I want to cover the whole spectrum of stewardship that I'm going to deal with missions a little bit later on. But there are three types of giving that are taught in the Word of God. Number one, the Bible teaches tithing. Number two, the Bible teaches free will offerings. Number three, the Bible teaches missions, giving. Now, let's just a brief analyzing of this. What is tithing? Tithing simply means that the first 10% of our increase does not belong to us. It belongs to God. And we're instructed of the Lord to separate His from ours and bring it, God said, to the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place His name there. There's not but one place on planet earth that God chose to place His name in this dispensation of the church, and that is the church. So we're to separate it, bring it to church, we're to dedicate it to God, and basically in the Word of God, we don't find anywhere that any tithe has ever seen anywhere. Sure, what that means, a tithe is God's method of, can I use language we understand, of paying the bills. Financing the normal local operation of the church right here at home. Now, I'm aware of the fact, and I only mentioned this briefly, I'm aware of the fact that there are those who, uh, I just call them critics preacher when it comes to the place of tithing. But I want to deal with three of them real quickly just to give you an answer to give to them because surely nobody in here would be against tithing today. But there are those who say, preacher, don't you know tithing's under the law? Look at me a moment. I enjoy being asked that. You know what that tells me about you, that, that person? They don't know much about the Bible. I don't mean to be smart. The Bible is very plainly 500 years approximately at least before, tithe, before the law was given. Abraham practiced tithing. About 400 years before the law was given, Jacob promised that he would tithe there that night. So tithing is clearly mentioned in the Scripture before the law was ever given. The second group of critics are those who say, well, 
It's my money. I earned it. I'll do what I want to with it. Well, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm going to answer that. God said it's his. You say it's yours. I wonder who will end that argument. I know who will win it. God said it's his. You say it's yours. We'll find out who wins that. God will win it. You know that to be true. But then number three, those who say, well, I cannot afford to tithe. And the honest truth is you cannot afford not to. It's cheaper to obey God and tithe and have God's blessings on 90% than it is to rob the Lord and have God's judgments on your life. So the first 10% of our income does not belong to us. It belongs to God. We're to separate his from ours, bring it to church, dedicate it to God, and then it's used to pay the bills, just the normal local operation of the local church. Then number two is the free will offering. Free will offering in the Bibles were established for special needs that arises in the life and ministry of the church. And so we all understand them. There's usually three things that factor into the free will offering. Number one, how the size of the need, how large is the need. Number two, how much I love that need. And number three, how much I can give to that. Those are ours. And it's free will. We make the choice of our own but then number three, there's a mission offering. And I ask the question, and I do it to provoke our thinking and set our mind in the right direction for the rest of the study. What is a mission offering? If you had a pencil piece of paper this morning with a question on it, what is a missions offering, how would you answer that question? Well, for most of us, the thing that, first thing that pops in our mind, it's an offering for missions, and that is correct. But I want something greater than that. What is a mission offering? Listen to me. A mission offering... It's money collected by the church, but not for the church. It's collected by the church to be distributed by the church to those serving God in other places. So when you realize that, that is exactly what I've read about in 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. This is money collected by the First Baptist Church at Corinth, but not for them. It's collected by them to be distributed by them to those serving the Lord in other places. I have no problem agreeing with you. There is a benevolence factor here, but there's a benevolence factor in every mission offering. Helping them live, helping them have something to eat, helping them pay their bills. And so I have no problem in that at all. But now I want to come to this and deal with it. I want you to listen to me. The mission offering, the tithe is fixed. It's 10% across the board. Free will offerings fluctuate. We may put in a dollar, five or 10 or more. But the mission offering... It's to be done by faith. Faith is not me telling God what I can or cannot do. I have a message I preach and I use a rather harsh title, preacher. I say, stop telling God what you can't do. And let God show you what he can do. But faith is you and God entering into agreement that like Hannah did. God, if you will, I will. And the pattern continues, you go on, Hannah did, God did. God said, I'm not going to let that woman outdo me. I'm going to reward her, not only with just one son, but with six children all together. God's spoon's bigger than your shovel. God will not let you outgive him when you give by faith. Several years ago, I was preaching a meeting just south of Indianapolis. I know I've told this here before. But uh, I walked in on a Sunday morning. They handed me a church bulletin. I think somebody gave me one this morning. It's probably in Oklahoma Pew. But anyway, somebody gave I, I took that church bulletin, preacher, and I opened it up and started reading. And this was the day, before the days of all the computer things. So it was kind of you bought one with a, the basic information over here in already hard print. And so it had the church's name and it had the pastor's name, address, phone number of the church. And then it had the schedule of services. And then it said the record speaks. And all that was normal in those old bulletins. You go back and find one, you'll see what I'm talking about. But in that, in that record speaks, it said attendance last Sunday. First line, and then a little bit, it said number rode the buses. Second, number in Sunday school. Thirdly, number in morning service. And everything's up, up to par to there. Everything's fine. And boy, when I see that next line, I can't believe it. In bold print, it said ties and tips. My first thought was, I wish I had thought of that. 
My second thought was if I had, I'd probably been too big a coward to put it in print. But I didn't have time for tithes and tips, so I just chunked it, uh, chunked it back in my Bible, and I did the Sunday school hour, the 11 o'clock hour. Then that afternoon, I started down toward home, coming down Interstate 65. And being a good independent fundamental judgmental Baptist, you know, I got to decide, do I like tithes and tips or do I don't like them? Well, I thought before I get too critical, I need to find out what's a tip. I couldn't go to Webster's Dictionary, so I went to Blue's. I usually agree with him. Mr. Bruce said that a tip is a small piece of money you leave lying on the table at the restaurant when you finish a meal just in case someone's watching. You don't want them to think you're a tightwad. I said, well, that sounds more like a Baptist offering all the time, doesn't it? But God's business cannot be financed with tips. I asked a question I've asked all over the country. What kind of God would it be that would set up a church and not set up a method of financing it? What kind of God would it be that would set up a great commission and not set up a method of financing it? I want to tell you, not the God of the Bible. Matter of fact, I want you to watch me, and I want you to give me an amen if you agree with me. There's a God in heaven. That sounds like somebody else. Let's be Baptists, all right? There's a God in heaven. Amen. That sounds like that other crowd of Baptists. Let's be independent Baptists, all right? Let's go. There is a God in heaven. Amen. There's a world going to hell. That God loves that world enough he gave his son to die for him. Come on. The same God that gave his son said all the silver and all the gold are mine. Amen. Now I want to ask you a question. What kind of God would it be that would send his son to die for the world and sit up in heaven and hoard the money needed for the world to hear about it. That's not the God of the Bible. See, one of the things that we must really deal with is learning what it is to give by faith. You know, can I say this, and I'm not making fun, preacher, I'm not making light when I say this at all. I do want to pull out a piece of money. That helps Baptists watch you more if you've got a piece of money in your hand. So I like to preach with money in my hand. No, I'm just going on. But uh, the... The God of the Bible gave his son to die for the world. It would almost be like the father betraying the son to send him to die and sit up in heaven and hoard the money needed. Can I get an amen there? You see what I'm saying? God's not that kind of God. Now, here's another thing that we've got to really work on, and I, I know this is read deep in a lot of our lives. But we have got to get beyond this poor old God. We've got to help him out. Faith promise giving is not, it is an opportunity for us to serve God, but it's a more of an opportunity for God to serve us. Let me illustrate. I got you real quiet. Now let me illustrate. My wife and I have three children. I would not advocate this in the society we live in today, but when our children were growing up teenagers, we lived in the country preacher, and down the road a piece was what we knew as just the store, the country store. We'd go to the grocery store on a Friday night or Saturday morning buy what we thought to be a week's groceries, and we'd run out of something. My wife would say something to me like, you know, uh, I need a gallon of milk. I need a gallon of milk. And uh, so I knew what she was wanting. She was either saying to me, go get it, or send one of the children. Well, I called the children around, and my two oldest, and I said to them, Run down to the store and get mama a gallon of milk. Anybody ever send their kids to the store? You don't do it today, I don't guess, but I'm talking about then we could. But with that, send the kids to the children to the store, there's always another gesture. Watch me. I ordered it. I pay for it. Why? They're my children. I'm their daddy. I ordered it. Now watch me. Hang on. I didn't order the Great Commission. But a greater father than I did. Amen. Amen. You think my heavenly father is going to tell me to do something and count on me to pay for it? The government don't even send people off to war at their own expense. 
What we got to learn is God wants to pay for everything he orders. Chew on it and say amen. God wants to pay for everything he orders. Poor old God up in heaven is not hurting. That's where faith comes in. It's not what I can do, not what you can do, but what he can do. And we just learn to be the channel that God work through us. Now, in our text here today, I'm just getting started. We're going to see there are four things about this method of giving to missions I want you to look at. Look at verse number 2. The Bible said, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. There are three things or four that I want to mention from that verse of Scripture. First of all, we learn that our missions giving is to be systematic giving upon the first day of the week. I'm aware of the fact not everybody gets paid every Friday, but there are those who get paid every two weeks and some paid every month. Some draw a monthly check. But we're to tithe regularly and systematically, and likewise, we're to give to missions systematically as our income is. Now, I know there are those who would look at that and say, well, preacher, I think you ought to give when you feel like it. You say, what's wrong with that? Can I tell you? You don't feel like it often enough. How would you like to be a missionary on a foreign field waiting on somebody to feel like sending support? I'd rather really know it's coming than to wait on them to feel like it. Can I get an amen there? So it's systematic giving. God's a God of order. You see, God's after more than just mission money. God is trying to de- develop in us some character, to be faithful, committed, consistent, trustworthy. So it's systematic giving. The only way the church can send it out systematically is we bring it in systematically. So we give systematically. Then number two, the Bible said it's to be total involvement. God said, let every one of you I want to ask you a question. I wish I knew how to deal with this passage of Scripture. Who's included in every one of you? Who's excluded? Are you one of you? I'm going to let you figure that out. God excludes none. God includes all. Every member of the church is commanded by the Lord to be involved in the mission program of that church. Total involvement. Every one of you is mentioned there in the Word of God. Now, because of denominational mission programs and how it's infiltrated our thinking and influenced our thinking, we have a tendency to feel like missions is a sideline. Do it if you want to. It'd be good if you did. But we do not see it as a command of God. But the Bible makes no bones about it. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you. Notice what else the Bible said. We're to lay by in store as God hath prospered him. Look how good God is to you, how good God has been to you. He is in person. He has been in provision, good to all of us down through the years. But then we learn that the reason for doing this systematic giving and the reason for this total involvement is that there, Paul said there will be no gathering when I come. You receive it on a systematic basis, and then the money is there when the need arises. Let me illustrate just a moment. You see, what if Brother Cofield got up on uh, the first Sunday in November and said, church, we're changing. Now, he's not going to do this, but we're changing our way of giving to missions. We're not going to take no mission money the first Sunday, the second Sunday, the third Sunday, fourth Sunday. But the last Sunday night in the month, he gets up and said, now, folk, we've got to have all these thousands of dollars to send out next week to missions. Two things would probably happen with that last Sunday night service. Number one, it would probably be a long service. Number two, it would not be long preacher until it becomes the smallest attended service. But you know what happens at Whitfield Baptist Church? Across this congregation, you give consistently. You give committedly. Whether you give once a week, you give once a month or twice a month, you give consistent. You know what happens? Time of the month rolls around to mail out the mission checks and the secretary mails them out and 99% of you probably know nothing about or even have a thought about it's time for the mission money again. The reason that the secretary can do that or everyone who mails it out 
is because of the consistency of your giving, systematic giving, total involvement. Let every one of you, and then it's to be given before the need arises so the need will be met when it's there. And then we learn number four, that it's to be not only systematic giving, total involvement according as God has prospered you, but we learn that missions giving is church business. Look down in the last part of verse number one, if you will. Please, Paul said, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia. Verse number three, he said, and when I come, whomsoever ye, speaking of the church, shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be me that I go also, they shall go with me. So the Bible teaches us that our missions giving is to be given to the local church and distributed by the authority of the local church. Now, the older I become, the more I preach, the more I study, the more strong I am in what I'm fixing to say, preacher. But God's a local church God. Amen. The Bible's a local church Bible. That's not a slam on mission boards and assist churches. I'm not against that at all. But the basic instrument of God's work here on earth is church, through the church, to the church. And God tells us that the mission program is church business. We give our mission money to the church mission program. It loses our identity. It takes on the church's identity. We're blessed for it. God uses as the church sends it out. Church gets the honor. God gets the glory. And then the membership that gives are blessed of God because of being obedient unto God. So we see that our mission's offering is to be systematic giving, total involvement, according as God's prospered you, given to the local church and distributed by the authority of the local church. Let me repeat one other thing before I move forward. The tithe is fixed. It's 10% across the board. The free will offering fluctuates. You may give a dollar, five, or 10, or 20. But the mission offering is by faith. And faith is you asking God what he wants you to do God lays it on your heart then with just a trusting obedience. You respond in giving what God lays on your heart to give. Now, I want to make this one other thought. You say, Brother Boo, you just talk about giving. Give a tithe, give a free will offering, give a mission offering. Well, there's a flip side to it. God said if we had tithe, he'd open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on us. There's not room to receive. And I raise my hand and say, I am a candidate for that kind of blessing. God said, if we're given the free will offering, he said, give and it shall be given unto you. And he uses four illustrations we all understand. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men heap into your bosom. And then we find that in the mission offering, we're going to give by faith. And so that's like God giving to me. Uh, Brother Cofield, I, I assume somewhere through the services you take up a change offering or a dollar offering where the kids bring it down. You have a kid march or something offering. So you know what I'm talking about. Here's a good picture of faith promise giving. A little child that has nothing knows somebody that's got something. And they run over there with a hand out. And that person gives them the change or the dollar, whatever it is. And all that child does is just get a hold of that money and bring it over here and put it in the jug or the jar or the basket, bucket, whatever it is. And they act like they've really done something. And they have done something, as far as they're concerned. But somebody who had nothing goes to somebody who has something. You know what happens? The giver gets to smile and he gets cheerful. She gets cheerful, the parent, the adult. The kid gets cheerful. And God's blessed. God's got money he wants to invest in world missions. Oh, I wish I could bury that in your soul or you'd never get over it. God has set aside money for world evangelization. When he gave the Great Commission, he knew what it would cost. God's not sitting up there like some businessman trying to figure out, oh, no, how am I going to do this now? Boy, I'm in, I'm in a time. No, no, that's not God. God's got the money. He's waiting on somebody that will believe him enough to reach out their hand. Say, God, if you will, I will. And watch God provide it for them. Now, again, let me emphasize. Missions giving is to be done systematically. It's to be done uh, a total involvement. 
It's to be done according as God has prospered us and it's to be given to the local church and distributed by the authority of the local church. Now, I want you to turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, if you will, please. And in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, I want to take these final minutes and share with you a practice of faith promise giving here by the churches of Macedonia. If you have a Scoville Bible at chapter number 8, you find at the heading, it mentions the examples of Macedonia. And then later on down in verse number 7, it mentions the exhortation to the church at Corinth between and before verse number 7. Let me tell you what's going on here and set this up for the next hour and we'll deal with it. There are two churches at least in Macedonia representing the churches of Macedonia. Notice it's plural. That would be the church at Philippi to whom Paul addresses a Philippian letter and the church at Thessalonica to whom he addresses two letters of the Thessalonians. Those sit at the top of the Aegean Sea in a province, a state, we would call it, called Macedonia. Connected to that is another state or province that is called Achaia. We don't hear that much, but the capital city of Achaia is Corinth. Now we know where we're at, don't we? So we're dealing with three churches, the churches of Macedonia, which is Philippi and Thessalonica, and the church at Corinth. Something happens in that area, which the Bible described, if you've got your Bible open there, chapter 8, verse number 2, of a, as a great trial of affliction. A great trial of affliction. Now, look at me just a moment. I like eyeball contact. When you look at this great trial of affliction, most Bible students believe it was a famine. And so I'm going to take it as it was a famine. Preacher, can you imagine a famine would mean to them then what it would be equivalent to an hour day of everyone who has employment and income losing it for four months. Can you imagine, church, what would happen if everybody lost their income for four months? I pray it never happens, and uh, I don't want it to happen to you or me either. But I know what I would do if I was Pastor Brother Cofield. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'd say, men, we got to have a men's meeting. Can I use that illustration with these churches? The church at Corinth, they have their men's meeting. You know what they decide? Please listen to what I'm saying. Let's stop giving to missions. Let's get ourselves through this. Then we'll consider missions again. Now, if you're not getting what I'm saying, there is no let's pray. There is no let's trust God. There's no let's give God a chance. They're depending totally upon themselves. But the church of Macedonia, you know what happens to them? They come out with some words like this. It hurts my heart even to say it, and I say it all the time. Let's believe God. Let's trust God. Let's give God a chance. Well, a Corinthian church goes in to the famine they discover they don't have any money to give to missions, have no money to pay the bills, and the church is dying. But the churches of Macedonia, they go into the same famine. You know what's happening over there? They're still supporting, they're still giving, God's still blessing them, and they're shouted out, they're seeing an increase, if we would say growth, as we would say. So the Corinthian church approaches Paul as if to say, what's going on? What's going on? Why is it that they have money to give and we don't? Paul said, let's see what they are doing. There's four statements, and I'll deal with them in a greater detail in the next period, but I want to mention them all now. In verse number five, because of the content, the Bible said, and this they did not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. The greatest thing you could do in this first service this morning is give yourself totally to God. If you're not saved, of course, give it to him to be saved. But if you are saved, then give yourself to God to let God do what he wants to do with your life. Then when they gave themselves first to the Lord, two things happen in verse number two. They've got an abundance of joy and a great trial of affliction. That's not really baptistic. But they're shouting it out in the midst of all this trouble. They're shouting it out. They're rejoicing. And then also look at the latter part of verse number two. 
Their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. They ended up giving more in a time of famine than they'd been giving in a time of fullness. You say, preacher, how do you do that? God. God. They believe God. They let God have a chance and they let God do what he wanted to do. They move by faith. But now look at verse number three. Here's the results of it. In verse number three, they're not only willing to give their person first, willing to give beyond their, or out of their poverty, but they're willing to give beyond their power. For to their power, I have a record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. And the only way you can give more than you can give is learn to let God give through you. And then finally, in verse number four, they gave as partners. Paul said, praying us with much entreaty that we will receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. When you and I give to missions, it's not goodbye to our money. It's investment. It is investment in others, and their fruit becomes our fruit at the judgment seat of Christ. So they gave systematically. They gave their person first. They gave their out of their poverty. They gave beyond their power, and they gave as partners. Lord willing, in the next hour, we will build upon that and continue. Father, Honor the word, use it to your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen, Pastor.